Hi, I'm Arthur Haynes, and I'm coming to you from the western mountains of Maine, deep in the winter. But earlier last year, during the growing season, I took some footage on adaptogens, uh, specific types of plant and fungal remedies that are used to help the body deal with stress. And I'm guessing that many of you might be looking for some fresh greenery at this point, so I'm going to bring that video out for you. Now, adaptogens are very special remedies that have been used around the world. And they work by helping the body adapt to both acute and excuse me, acute and chronic stress. And these stresses can be of any form, whether that be biological, environmental, physical, psychological. So all of these forms are covered under what adaptogens are able to help the body deal with. Adaptogens can be thought of as compiling a whole lot of different actions into one remedy, such as tonics, alteratives, and antioxidants. And what's really special about these is that they are intelligent organisms. And by that, I mean they are able to exert a bi-directional influence on the endocrine system, the nervous system, and the immune system. And by bi-directional, I'm referring to the fact that they are able to stimulate a depressed function or depress an overstimulated function. Now, adaptogens are described as working in a non-specific manner. And I always wrestled with this concept because I wanted to know exactly how these things function. Well, how is it that they simply make our body deal with stress better and recover from stress faster? Well, a lot of work has gone on more recently, particularly in the latter half of the 1900s and into uh, this century, looking at specifically how adaptogens function in the body. And what we've learned is they work on the endocrine system. In particular, there's a couple of parts of that. The HPA axis, which is the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal gland, as well as the sympathoadrenal system. These are two parts of the endocrine system that deal with stress and are related to the body coping with stress. And what adaptogens were found to do is to upregulate a number of beneficial compounds that help various cells or structures within the cells deal with various types of stress. In other words, enhancing the longevity of those cells, as well as downregulating various enzymes and compounds that can promote inflammation and oxidation, two things that essentially speed up um, the aging of cells. Now there are a number of well-known adaptogens from around the world. Things like the reishi fungus, uh, shatavari, which is a species of asparagus, uh, the membranous astragalus, or the membranous milk vetch, the same species, a member of the legume family, and things like American ginseng, Asian ginseng and Siberian ginseng, all of which are very, very well known as adaptogens and are sold in health food stores. Well, someone who's interested in the real self-reliance that comes with wild crafting, as well as the potency of wild collected plants, will be looking for something outside of the store to be gathered in this setting. And here in the eastern United States, we have three species that are known to function as adaptogens. One of them is the reishi fungus. Now, this is to be uh, separated from hemlock reishi, which does not have the research supporting it functioning as an adaptogen. But we also have rose root, which is a fleshy herb of cliffs and the uh, Atlantic coastline. It's sometimes also called rhodiola um, by its generic name. And this is a fairly rare species. Uh, American ginseng as well here in the east is another well-known adaptogen. But unfortunately, it too is extremely rare. And it is really ethically um, unconscionable to collect this from the wild because it is so rare here, particularly in the Northeast, where it has been over collected and exported to Asia. So, what is the wild crafter to do? Well, I wrestled with this problem for a long time, wondering how to pull wild collected adaptogens into my life without worrying about over collecting and damaging wild species um, that we have here in the Northeast. And Finally, an answer came to me, and that's something that I want to share with you. 
The answer that finally came was a plant called dwarf ginseng, or Panax trifolius. Now, dwarf ginseng is a species related to American ginseng. It belongs to the same genus, except it is a spring ephemeral. It comes out early in the year, and by the end of June has disappeared and died back below the ground. But the wonderful thing about this plant is it occurs in many areas by the thousands, including on a property nearby here where I live. It's in the multiple thousands of individuals so it can support collection. Now, the, also another great thing about American, uh, excuse me, about dwarf ginseng is research has shown that it contains many of the exact same ginsenocides. These are saponin-type compounds that are known from American ginseng. And these compounds are believed to be in part responsible for the adaptogenic actions that these plants uh, provide people. And what I want you to really be aware of is that these ginsenocides are found in the aerial portions of the plant in both American ginseng and dwarf ginseng. And in fact, some research has shown that the compounds are even higher concentrations in the aerial parts of the plant relative to the below ground parts, which means that we can gather these, make effective medicine by simply collecting the above ground portion of the plant and never harming the below ground part, the tuber or rhizome, depending on the species that we're talking about. This is really pretty incredible because we have a way of gathering from the wild a potent adaptogen without worrying about over-harvesting and damaging, or in other words, causing decline to the populations. Now, I'm going to show you a video um, just after I'm done speaking that will go over one method that I collect this plant. But I want you to know you can simply gather any parts you want, including just the aerial portions, dry and tincture these. And you'll want to use a tincture because saponins are terpenes which are much more soluble in alcohol than they are water. And before I leave you, I really want to impress on you the value of adaptogens. And I'm going to lay out some of the ways that these have been used. Adaptogens, and there is research to defend everything I'm about to mention to you, including folk use by traditional peoples as well as the North American indigenous. These have been used by athletes to recover um, from extreme workouts more quickly so that they can res their bodies can respond better and work out much harder and reach new peaks in fitness. They have been used to deal with insomnia, depression. They have been used to help cope with psychological stress, particularly that midwinter depression and stress that people often um, experience, particularly when vitamin D levels are low. They've been shown to uh, enhance longevity in people, to protect against cancer, and they even potentiate the effectiveness of other medicines. And they do this so that less medicine of other types, whether that is prescription drugs or natural healing, uh, less of that is needed to still receive the same effects. Not to mention adaptogens have a long history of use um, of helping with sexual desire and dealing with sexual dysfunction. Now, there's other uses as well, and I encourage you to do a bit of research on how adaptogens can influence your life. If you do decide to go to the wild and seek out dwarf ginseng, I do hope that you will show gratitude and be sure to collect conscientiously so that the generations to come can experience this wonderful plant as well. So where does dwarf ginseng grow? Well, unlike American ginseng, which has a high specificity for certain types of enriched habitats, these are usually calcium-bearing bedrocks that are quite limiting in a lot of New England, dwarf ginseng is a little less specific. And that means that we can find it more abundantly on the landscape. Dwarf ginseng loves deciduous forests, such as sugar maple, and white ash for us and it loves places that are seasonally wet these can be along streams uh, seepage pools in the springtime of the year or at the bases of slopes properly timing the collection of dwarf ginseng is imperative especially if i'm looking to be a conscientious forager and i'm worried about the resource because dwarf ginseng is a spring ephemeral 
that means that it senesces or dies back below the ground fairly early in the season. In fact, this is the middle of June and some of the older, more mature plants are already turning yellow, have fallen over to the forest floor and are beginning to start that senescence, that dying back below the ground. Now the issue here is I'm trying to gather these plants while they're in fruit. That way I can plant some of the fruits as I'm digging in the soil so that I can put back some of what I take. The problem is there's a very narrow window between when the fruits are completely mature and when the plants begin to die back. And I have about a week or so before the plants turn yellow and they're clearly beginning to alter their phytochemical constituency. So here's a dwarf ginseng plant. You can see they're quite tiny. This one's actually in fruit, as is this one here. And the clusters of fruits are right there at the tip. And if we look carefully, you can see some of the yellowed plants, which are actually beginning to senesce. So those plants, I could certainly collect the underground part of the plant, but the above ground part of the plant, I would leave alone. Here are some freshly unearthed roots, and you can see that these little tiny tubers, here's my finger for scale, are quite small and fairly inefficient to collect unless you have a lot of time. But one of the great things about this plant, remember, is that the ginsenocides have been found in the leaves as well. And we know from the other species of Panax that they're also in the fruits. And here are two fruiting plants on the left. So if you really want to be conservative in your collection, you can merely gather the above ground portion of the plant and leave the tubers completely alone. And in fact, while you're gathering the above ground portion of the plant, you can even replant the fruits, these yellowish little berry-like structures that you see at the top of the plant as a way of making sure you'll have lots of dwarf ginseng in the coming years. Sometimes we're a little late for some plants in the population, and you can see that most of these here in the view are yellow and have fallen over, meaning they're beginning to die back. It's very difficult to follow their stems underground to find the location of the small tubers, and it's inefficient to go after these one at a time anyways. So what I want you to notice is there's a concentration of plants here. So I can actually unearth this small area and simply find the tubers scattered in the soil. This is a much more efficient way to go after the underground organs. The other thing that's happened here is the plants have already fruited and I can see their fruits, their tiny yellowish green fruits lying on the leaves of the forest floor. So as I till in the ground, I'll actually put these fruits where they need to be, just below the leaf litter so they can make contact with humic rich organic soil and yet be protected from desiccation by the leaf litter. Plants have a way of helping you understand when fruits are mature. And usually, in many cases, the fruits fall off the plant when they're mature. So these were very easy to dislodge from the plant and landed on the ground. And what I'm going to do is take and drop those into the places where I've excavated the tubers. And now I'll just carefully cover those up just under the leaves. And now I've done my planting for next year's dwarf ginseng crop. With dwarf ginseng, we're dealing with such small underground portions that it actually becomes very efficient from a foraging perspective to actually gather the above ground parts of the plant. And if you take a look, I've put together this small bunch of the above ground plants. And this took about five minutes or so. I have probably 40 or 50 plants gathered here. Remember that dwarf ginseng in places will grow by the thousands at the base of these rich slopes and deciduous forests. So I'm really taking only a very small portion of the population. But further, you'll notice at this time of year, we're talking early to mid-June, the connection between the above ground stem and the tuber underground is becoming very fragile. And as I lift these plants out of the ground, all of the tubers stayed below the ground, meaning that I've left the overwintering part of the plant in the ground. So I've actually have done very little harm to the population, and yet I still get a part of this plant that is known to contain active ginsenocides.